Going Nowhere. Episode 14. All Signs Point Nowhere. What is recorded in history, what you learned, and the events that occurred will never completely align. Those who outlive us are the ones able to repeat our stories. And more times than not, we are survived by not great people. Nowhere, Indiana has had disappearances and deaths form the very mortar that holds together this town. To be fair, upon first glance, you would think they were isolated incidents. Those involved could barely explain what happened to them, and were eventually told to just quiet down. How could I have also become so blind to the glaring pattern in Nowhere's history? November 23rd, 2001. Easton Tenney walks into his apartment building at 3.36 a.m., having completed his night shift at the local hospital. Despite living on the fourth floor, Easton begins systematically knocking on every door on the first floor, one after the other, not waiting for a response before moving on to the next. This was in full view of the security cameras on the perimeter of the floor. Except, every neighbor that was questioned said that when they looked through the peephole, or stuck their head out the front door, the floor was empty. Where was Tenny, med student turned prankster, suddenly? Well, after he moved out of range of the cameras, the knocking stopped for about 15 minutes. At 3.59, Residents on that floor reported hearing the knocking again, this time coming from the floor under their apartment. It went on for 20 more minutes before stopping entirely. Easton Tenney was never heard from again, and no obituary ever crossed the desk of Town Hall. The actual witness statements given by several of the floor's residents were conveniently misfiled in police records as a solved vandalism case. August 14th, 1969. Greta Nisha filed a police report about a man she saw standing outside of her house one hot summer evening. Late one night, staying up in her living room, Greta felt the presence of eyes on her. Out of the corner of her vision, she caught the shape of a human figure through the cracks of her blinds. Ever so carefully, she moved the blinds with one finger and was greeted with the sight of a man standing on the sidewalk in front of her house. It was a man she did not recognize, despite living on the street she grew up with, that hadn't seen a new resident in decades. He stared through her front window with a blank expression, unmoving, pale and waxy as the moon, wearing an ill-fitting suit. Knowing her roommate was home and at least one of her kind neighbors owned a shotgun, she peeked her head out the front door to yell at the man for leering. It had been maybe five, ten seconds since she had seen him through the blinds. There was no man there. She stepped outside, looking both ways down the street, but he was nowhere to be found. 
The only thing to indicate any sort of presence was damp footprints where he had been standing, and the overwhelming smell of petrichor, like a summer rainstorm, in the air. It hadn't rained in nearly a week. And eventually, that case file was found tucked between expense reports from 1972 and someone's moldy sandwich. April 10th, 2013. The fridge in the brick room of Ivanhoe's always made a funny, wobbly, thumping sound. Bridget Rivers never thought anything of it. Her colleague Dylan, on the other hand, found it much more annoying, always commenting on it whenever they had shifts together. He claimed it got worse late at night, when he was alone and trying to close the store by himself. The cream white linoleum walls, the stained, checkered tile floor would stretch impossibly long, never seeming to end no matter how much he ran. Fluorescent lights above became a searing, brilliant thing, and the old fridge in the break room wobbled along, its motor humming so loud he could barely think. Well, Bridget wasn't being paid to listen to him complain about closing. She was being paid to sling ice cream. And she did so, until a customer called her attention towards the slender window that served as the only viewpoint to the break room from the counter. Dylan, for reasons unknown, was attempting to climb inside the old fridge, and managed to succeed in doing so as he closed the door behind him. Bridget quickly ran to the break room and threw open the fridge doors, preparing to tell him off. But the fridge was empty. Dylan wasn't there. In fact, he managed to also disappear off the employee roster and his apartment's lease. Bridget quit her job after that and the missing person's report she filed was caught on its way to the shredder. Amidst some intern's CVs. So, I know where I went wrong. I became too focused on why is this happening, and the why these people, and the why is this town so macabre, it's Indiana for God's sake. I lost sight of the simple what and who. What exactly is occurring and who is involved. The who in many of these instances has been taken from us. And while I don't have answers, I know where I might find them. And I also know that the place where they are housed is the same institution throwing the proverbial blanket over the dead elephant in the room for many of these cases. If you ever wanted to know why your town covers up its ever-dwindling population, why you can't remember certain people in your life, why it all seems to be going to hell in a handbag, may I offer you some hypothetical advice? Research, of course, is key. Learn the names of your local librarians. They'll appreciate it. If you don't have all the expertise you need, don't be afraid to call in a little backup from similarly-minded colleagues. They're usually more than happy to help. For example... Listen, Meg, I, I got the texts, and... I agree that what is happening right now isn't okay, even in the slightest. But the issue is, what is happening? You guys have all these theories that you can tell me, but they can't... I, I can't. If there's... Ugh, look, 
things are weird right now and someone has got to have answers that they're not sharing. And when I think about it, my head hurts, like really, really hurts with the blood rushing through my head, making it feel like a vein is about to burst. And suddenly I can't even concentrate on the question I was thinking of, let alone what the answer might be. How are you supposed to get the answers when the actual concept of the thing you're investigating doesn't even stay in your head for more than a minute? When you have a plan, an actual plan, not an Ellie Novak plan or even a Meg Bliss plan, then call me. In many instances in academia, knowledge is locked behind a paywall. Or in this case, an actual wall. Don't be afraid to get your hands dirty with some light adventuring. You might go ahead and try hunting for a historic landmark. Say, a series of collapsed underground tunnels. Then you end up finding the tunnels, begin exploring and mapping said tunnels, all while adventuring to other historic areas such as every place there's ever been a dead body, including the potter's field several miles away from the church, the radio tower, the cemetery again, and various historic homes open to public viewing. Well, then you may end up getting complaints and receiving death threats from citizens, then more formal complaints and pleas to stop from the mayor, then getting legal warnings from both your employer and law enforcement telling you that it's dangerous and trespassing. But ultimately, urban exploration is just a fun time. If you pick up this hobby, you get the benefits of being able to commune with history, free workouts, and an enjoyable weekend activity with willing or sometimes coerced participants. If you are going hiking underground, perhaps in some historic untouched landmark, you're going to need supplies. This may help. Okay, packing list for dusty old tunnels, since you told me to remind you. Flashlight, spare batteries, additional batteries on top of those spare batteries, headlamp, surgical mask with a bandana over it because old dust isn't fun, water, camera, extra batteries for the camera, extra memory card, Travel phone charger, small bit of food, just in case. Wet wipes, uh, buh, 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 buh. I got bored after making this list, and luck, I guess. Okay, I can spit this as many ways as I want, but nowhere is essentially one big mystery. I don't even know where to begin unraveling the town as a whole as easily as I could its history. I'm not sure I'll ever have the means to. It takes a lot more work to pick apart the flaws and inner workings of a system you are inside of. Which doesn't mean it's not supposed to happen, just, just that it's going to take a lot more work time and resources than I have right now. But that doesn't mean I've given up. Will we ever know the full story of Nowhere, Indiana? Who's to say? But somewhere, there is a room full of information to start. It has the name of someone I've forgotten in it. I know where it is. I know it has to be there. And if I can find that room, I can begin to figure out what the rest of this all means. Going Nowhere is a weekly mystery podcast produced by the Nowhere radio station. In this episode, Scotty Walker was played by Aaron Ray. 
at Aaron Ray VO on Twitter. Ellie Novak was played by Elizabeth Plant. Make sure to subscribe to catch the next episode. Rate and review us on iTunes or leave us a like. Your support genuinely helps. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at The Nowhere Radio. Visit our Twitter for a link to our Discord community. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.